fairly um, dramatic. I think we should probably we should probably start now. Uh, we have a good uh, good number of people. Um, so I will do the the formal welcome before handing it over to John. Uh, John, are you going to introduce the rest of the panel? Yes, yes. Yourself? Great. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we really have a, a fantastic panel um, of real world leading experts on on oil, uh, who, as I mentioned, I've I've been reading since I was an undergraduate, and it's it's very exciting to to get their views, and it's obviously a very good time to have this event as we don't have uh, white smoke coming out of the OPEC meeting. Um, there's a lot going on, de demand destruction, um, OPEC plus cuts. There's a lot going on in the world of oil, and this obviously has huge huge implications for uh, the Middle East and for the entire world. So it's a very timely topic and it's a real world-class panel that we're, uh, we're really honored to have. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. John Spakainakis, who is a member of the Manaf Advisory Board and uh, the Master of Ceremonies, and I hope a participant as well today in, uh, in today's conversation. So thank you very much, Dr. John. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to our panelists. Uh, what a great start. Um, it's really an honor to be hosting um, three great uh, scholars when it comes to hydrocarbons and oil, uh, the Gulf, Saudi Arabia and beyond. Uh, and to your point, Jay, as I was growing up, I got to read a lot uh, the contributions of Giacomo Luciani, uh, a very well known economist. Uh, and then I got to work for him and with him. And then he became in many ways a mentor. Uh, and then as I was growing up uh, in my jobs, I used to write the excellent research produced by Adam Siminski, who is currently the president of CAPSARC, an excellent institution that uh, contributes greatly to the study of oil and uh, not just oil. Um, and uh, has done a, a tremendous job uh, recently hosting uh, the T20. And uh, last but not least, uh, Jim Crane, who I've known for many, many years, uh, and now more recently over the, the past few years, he has been writing a lot on oil, the future of oil, Saudi Arabia, energy markets. Uh, so it's really a unique opportunity we have with these uh, three great scholars to tell us a little bit about where is oil going? Um, what is the future of oil? This is not a session where we are going to predict the price of oil, uh, nor are we going, I hope, not to tell you that this country is gonna do badly and the other great, uh, but this is more to put things in perspective uh, and to take out the noise in many ways from all the things that we hear that suddenly oil is going to disappear. We peaked in oil demand and EVs are entering the market and all these countries are gonna fall apart. Um, this is far the case. We want to really bring um, the knowledge to, to the front and uh, really analyze what is happening. And I wanna give the opportunity to Adam Saminski. Uh, great honor, Adam, to have you. Please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, John, and uh, salam alaikum to all my friends in the region here. Uh, John, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction, and I'd also like to say thank you to the Cambridge Middle East and uh, North Africa Forum. This is, uh, I, I think, well, I'm, I'm planning on having a good time tonight, and I hope there'll be a lot of questions. I'm looking at the clock now, and I promise to keep my remarks to 10 minutes. Uh, the purpose of the webinar, as I understood it, was to talk about the future of the oil market in light of supply and demand dynamics. And let me just start by saying, it seems that the, the two or three biggest factors in the markets this year was first the impact of the COVID crisis on demand. And I think in general, the overall response of OPEC, the uh, the uh, OPEC plus uh, energy ministers, even the G20 actually got into the act on looking for ways to uh, stabilize the oil markets in the aftermath of what uh, I think most people believe is 
probably the greatest demand uh, crisis that uh, we've seen in a long time. Uh, there were estimates made uh, in, uh, you know, recently that, and the numbers are still being tracked down, that demand for petroleum on a global basis in April might have fallen by 20 million barrels a day. And we never had anything quite like that in one month. Uh, and at the same time, John, one of the other factors that I think uh, we're dealing with uh, is the uh, increasing uh, identification of climate change as an urban, ur urgent uh, global challenge. Uh, the scientific evidence seems pretty clear that man-made man greenhouse gases are contributing to global warming, and uh, efforts have been made over the past two decades, I think, actually, to try to figure out a way to manage uh, greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide, uh, and pointing out the, the importance of collective mitigation and adaptation efforts. There have even been uh, some people calling for a ban on hydrocarbons. And I, I don't know how we could actually have a discussion tonight without talking about you know, can we ban hydrocarbons? Or has the COVID uh, crisis uh, accelerated the trends that some people believe were already underway, moving towards renewables uh, as, as a primary uh, source of energy? Um, I, I want to start off with by saying that 80% uh, of the world's energy supply is still coming from hydrocarbons. That number actually hasn't changed a whole lot in the last two decades, despite enormous efforts to try to use efficiency and renewables, uh, wind, solar, uh, and, and even bio-renewables as a, a way to, to manage the, the climate effort. So in uh, Saudi Arabia and Capsar uh, had a hand in this, but many uh, institutions and companies in the kingdom uh, have been working on this idea that we call the circular carbon economy. And circular carbon economy builds on the ideas of the circular economy. Most people know what that means. Uh, generally, the circular economy focuses in on material flows and looks at reduce, reuse, and recycle. The circular carbon economy adds remove to those first three R's, so there are four R's, and really tends to focus more on the carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas side of the flows and energy flows rather than material flows. Uh, the, the idea again of the circular carbon economy is to try to look at the carbon management issue in a integrated and holistic manner that, that says all possible technological solutions uh, uh, have a role to play because it's pretty clear, even from the UN's IPCC uh, uh, scenarios and model runs, uh, that it's going to be very hard to uh, e even approach the Paris Agreement without having, uh, for example, carbon capture and storage. That would fall under the remove category. Other things in the remove category include things like direct air capture uh, and even uh, uh, bio storage in uh, ocean uh, storage, seaweed, for example, mangroves on the coastal areas and forestation, uh, reforestation efforts uh, on land uh, fall within that. And in the recycle and reuse categories, you have things like using carbon dioxide to uh, create uh, new fuels, uh, pretty expensive to do that. Um, you could use carbon dioxide and enhanced oil recovery. And if you have a fairly decent environmental footprint, carbon footprint on your oil to begin with, uh, there could be positive gains there in terms of addressing uh, CO2. It also includes things like CO2 into fertilizers uh, and, uh, and methanol or ethanol. Uh, those don't tend to lock things up for the length of time that uh, that options like using CO2 to cure concrete uh, or even finding ways to uh, reduce the amount of CO2 coming from concrete cement production. Uh, 
uh, let me just let me come back to this idea of again the 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 concept reduce the amount of carbon entering in the economy to begin with and Saudi Arabia is not opposed to the idea of efficiency and renewables um, one of the, the kingdom has a huge program underway for automobile efficiency air conditioning efficiency very important particularly in the GCC MENA region uh, the kingdom uh, has uh, pretty strict uh, fuel efficiency standards for automobiles and has actually moved towards uh, market pricing for gasoline as an example. The largest green hydrogen project in the world is underway in the kingdom at NEOM. Uh, uh, Aramco and SABIC have been working on uh, blue hydrogen, turning uh, the hydrogen into ammonia, shipping the green ammonia or blue ammonia um, uh, outside of the kingdom, these kinds of things. Reducing the amount of carbon entering in the economy in the beginning is a great idea. Reusing carbon as an input to create valuable feedstocks and fuels is what reuse is about. Recycling through the natural carbon cycle. Uh, and then finally, removing excess carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, CAPSARC has, a, has worked with uh, five very respected international organizations, the International Energy Agency, the International Renewable Energy Agency, Nuclear Energy Agency, the Global CCS Institute, and the OECD Policy Office to author a guide to the circular carbon economy. It's on www.ccguide.org. There's everything that you want to know about all of the technological options that we think are available are in there. The guide shows that there are problems in mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. It looks at some of the hard to abate sectors like aviation, shipping, steel, aluminum, cement, petrochemicals, and so on. Um, it, it pushes the idea of trying to minimize stranded assets. It looks at an orderly transition. Uh, and it particularly looks at ways uh, through regulatory and financial frameworks to try to push uh, the technology associated with uh, mitigating uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, the uh, CCE framework was actually endorsed by the G20 uh, summit leaders. Um, and uh, I think that it is critical if we're really going to address CO2 uh, in a practical way. And if we are going to see countries in the GCC region who have uh, generally a high, uh, you know, and MENA, uh, many countries with a high dependency on hydrocarbons uh, as their economic base, uh, finding a way to move uh, in an orderly way towards uh, a transition if we're going to see one. And, and in particular, making sure that if we do end up seeing uh, uh, maybe not even a decline in petroleum, but a, petro a plateau or an increase, uh, that we have options to manage the emissions that will be coming from those fuels. Uh, I said I would take 10 minutes. I think that was nine, John. I wanna, I wanna, I'm going to give you back my minute, and uh, I'm looking forward to questions and discussion uh, after the rest of the panelists are, are have a chance to talk. So thank you, John. Yeah, thank you, Adam. Wonderful. Thank you very much. A uh, lot of things to discuss. Uh, Jim? Hi. Well, thanks, John. Thanks, Adam. That was uh, really interesting. Great stuff. Uh, lots of food for thought there. Um, and thanks to the, the, the MENA Forum for having me. Uh, it's great to be back in Cambridge, if only virtually. Uh, I've heard from uh, sources in Cambridge that the city is actually, uh, don't tell anybody, but it's better than ever without all the tourist hordes. I don't know, not sure we can, <laughs> not sure it's okay to say that, but um, uh, maybe maybe some of the folks that are in town can can, can clue me in on the, in the Q&A. Um, so I wanna focus a little bit more narrowly. Um, uh, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm here in Houston, so I think it might be, uh, uh, yeah, I get it. It's a little, maybe a little easier for me to talk about Saudi Arabia uh, from here. Um, and so I want to talk about Saudi Arabia is where a lot of my, my research uh, uh, looks at um, and, um, uh, and how the kingdom might ap approach an oil market in decline. I'm not saying the oil market is going to decline, uh, but as Adam said, you know, we may see a plateau 
uh, at some point uh, in oil. Uh, and, you know, how might uh, uh, countries develop strategies to, per, to, to, to deal with that uh, a plateau or decline? How might Saudi Arabia preserve its oil rent dominated economy and its nearly unique system of governance, right? There aren't that many absolute monarchies left in the world and most of those uh, are uh, based on, on oil rents. So, um, so this is to talk based on some, uh, a couple of papers I've written recently and another one that's in progress. Um, I hope it makes a good starting off point to look at how other producers might behave. Um, so a few initial points. Uh, so Saudi Aramco, okay, the big national oil company in the kingdom is the cheapest and the lowest carbon oil producer in the world at the moment, right? Uh, it's also the entity that provides the funding, most of the funding that keeps the Saudi royal family in power, right? So two really strategic roles, big roles. Um, so Ramco executives and Saudi oil ministry officials have over the past couple of years made it pretty clear that Saudi Ramco is not going to be one of the firms that sort of bows out uh, early from the oil business. Not, it's not going to behave like some of the shareholder owned IOCs that are becoming, you know, IECs sort of international energy companies, um, maybe bowing partly to social pressures, uh, unless uh, uh, returns on oil fall to the point where the Saudi competitive advantage may not matter so much anymore. And that seems to be far off, right? Um, so I see three important calculations behind Saudi Aramco's bid for longevity, right? So, and there's probably more, and I'd love to hear from from, from, from everybody on this, if there's, if there's other rationales for this. But, but the first one is that the regime survival, uh, which is always the, 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 the sort of the main driver, it seems to be in decision-making, regime survival and external security for Saudi Arabia still remain reliant on regime control over oil rents, right? And replacing those rents, you know, I mean, it's, it's an ongoing process, but it's a long process and it's a pretty uncertain uh, process, right? Uh, second is that the uh, the risks to Saudi Arabia from the loss of those oil rents uh, is, outweighs the risk of climate damage to the kingdom, I think, in the view of Saudi elites uh, at any rate, right? So, and I think it's the notion is that climate damage isn't going to go away uh, if Saudi Arabia leaves the oil business and other firms continue to market oil, right? So, um, uh, so it may not even uh, you know, have a huge effect. Third, that even in a world that's serious about decarbonization uh, and, and, and taking climate action, there's going to be long-term uses for oil that remain, including non-combustion uses for oil. The so Saudi Arabia can, uh, at least for now, present itself as the optimal producer for a climate-stressed world, given its low cost and low carbon intensity, right? So in, in, in another uh, forum like this recently that, uh, that Giacomo was uh, presiding over, uh, a bunch of us argued that Saudi Aramco could actually monetize that carbon advantage by declaring its, its intent to pursue carbon neutrality by 2050, uh, and then maybe embarking on this competitive decarbonization race that it's already leading. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to chat further about that in the uh, in the discussion. But here I want to tease out how the Saudis might behave in a plateaued or in a declining oil market. So let's assume, just for our purposes here, that that uh, uh, global oil demand shifts into a plateau and a slow decline, right? And that public opinion, global public opinion, and government policy continues to emphasize reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So you know that decline in demand would probably force prices down, uh, but we might still see some, some spikes in, in, in price and in demand because of underinvestment and, and other market actions, collusion among OPEC, et cetera. So uh, oil, oil demand and, and prices would still fall, but, but longer term trend would be, would be down. Um, so Saudi Arabia is the leader of OPEC. You know, I see two broad strategies that it might pursue. Okay, so the first one is, I call managed decline. Uh, the second one I'll talk about is sort of a market share strategy. So managed decline is would, would kind of continue the collective action through OPEC uh, of doling out oil production quotas that uh, 
uh, that, 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 that are used to, make, to keep uh, oil prices higher. Sort of a soft landing strategy for big producers. It gives oil dependent states, countries, uh, more time to pursue economic diversification, more funds to pursue economic diversification. Um, and OPEC might even use carbon intensity as one of the criteria uh, for doling out its, uh, uh, its, its quotas for production. Um, however, this managed decline strategy would, would, would imply a really, a, you know, a large long-term sacrifice from Saudi Arabia. It would, it would mean ceding some market share to other OPEC members, as well as free riders like, uh, like U.S. Shale, the big one. Um, uh, so over the short run, it might be advantageous. You know, they might get a per barrel, the, the, the per barrel premium from, from, from reducing production might outweigh revenues lost from reducing exports, but longer term, uh, Saudi Arabia would, might, you might see the, the kingdoms kind of forced into these continual cuts that wind up ceding market share to free riders, probably would be untenable over the long term. Um, and, you know, if we see a, a, a demand falling, uh, you know, collusion might, might actually get less and less profitable, right? It might only be worth doing when oil prices are really low, like, you know, like they are now. Or, uh, so, uh, so Saudi might instead prefer a market share oriented strategy, okay? So different, uh, 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 and this would be, you know, sort of uh, bro broadly sacrificing short-term rents to minimize stranded reserves, right? Over the long term, it would require preparation, I would think, starting with more cash in the central bank. I'm sure John could, could talk about that. Um, uh, so Saudi Aramco would, would, would raise production under this scenario, drive down prices and take market share from higher cost producers. Um, can, it would it, it probably continue to kind of wrest control over the value chain through refining and pet chems uh, to ensure that its reserves are monetized so that, you know, that it can place those cargos uh, when and where it needs to. Would it have to leave OPEC to do this? Um, maybe maybe in an extreme case, but, but, but probably not. Um, I think it might be sufficient for the kingdom to pursue periodic bouts uh, of low prices that aren't enough to force shut-ins, to force rival producers to actually shut in their production, uh, but might be enough just to thwart new investment, to, for, to bring down uh, the level of investment. And underinvestment might actually be Aramco's new ally in this market share quest. Like, so you'd see Saudi production becoming the supply that replaces that loss to natural declines. Um, so this market share strategy might actually have some other advantages, right? So if, if, if Saudi's market share does increase globally, it would boost its, ge it sort of re reinvigorate its geopolitical stature, right? Maybe only temporarily, but you know, who knows for how long. Um, we might see lower oil prices that would bring back uh, a stronger global demand for oil. Oil might compete more handily with substitute fuels and technologies, EVs, et cetera. Uh, and climate policy might actually have to kind of be reformulated and push a little harder to, uh, to, to do the work of reducing demand. So um, we ought, might also see a more chaotic uh, and competitive, certainly more competitive oil market uh, and it might even devolve into like dirty tricks. You might see countries, you know, interfering in, uh, in, in you know, in, in, into the uh, domestic affairs of others, fomenting unrest or causing other kind of above ground problems that, that prevent rival producers from getting their crude to market. Um, you might see, you know, like we have under, especially under the Trump administration, lots of oil state lobbying in Washington for sanctions on rival producer countries, right? We've got, you know, the US has got sanctions on Iran, Venezuela, uh, and Russia right now. We might see more of that kind of uh, behavior or attempted behavior. So to, to, to finish up, um, you know, how would this shake out? I mean, we, you know, we, we don't know, but, you know, it probably would be a bit of oscillation. I think Saudi Arabia would kind of continue to do what it's doing now. Uh, uh, oscillating between these two on it, using, using the price war to kind of shape the oil market in, in favorable, favorable ways, um, leaving OPEC probably maybe a step too far. I think it, it, it renders the kingdom maybe a little less able to pursue collective action when it needs to, right? So collusion still pays at a, at a low oil price like, like we have now. 
Um, but maybe a smaller OPEC might might work, right? So you maybe OPEC with you know Saudi, Russia, maybe Iraq uh, might be enough. Um, uh, uh, I think you know Adam may have done some work on this. Um, uh, the, and we, we've also seen it might require a bit more political control over over Aramco. Um, uh, you know, I think we've seen a little bit of that under under King Salman, a little bit more increase of, of government uh, uh, control over Aramco. That's usually seen as a negative. Um, but in this case, I think, you know, the Saudi's oil market strategy has gotten so geopolitical and may may get even more geopolitical that it probably needs that that strong political determined determination uh, to it. And, you know, we're starting to see some of the, the a little bit of, uh, you know, shifting geopolitical alliances, maybe some big ones. Right. So, uh, you know, the, the new security ties with Israel, et cetera. We might see a bit more of those ge geopolitical shifts going on uh, around the region among oil states, et cetera, if we, we see reduced strategic interest from Washington. So I'll leave it there uh, and, uh, and, and hand it back to John. Great, Jim, fantastic. Uh, a lot of things to really Mull over. I mean, uh, uh, thinking about the the politics, but also the economics of energy, uh, the dynamism that you described. I mean, obviously they'll have to take some really hard decisions going forward. Uh, the Saudis and 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 uh, and everybody else involved in the decision making circles. Uh, Giacomo. Thank you, John. Thank you, uh, Adam and Jim. Uh, uh, I will um, start by by saying that um, I think in any uh, scenario of uh, plateauing or uh, decreasing oil demand, uh, uh, we need to uh, take into account uh, the likely behavior of prices. Uh, and that is, uh, is very important. Um, first of all, it is true that uh, the COVID pandemic has caused uh, a sharp uh, decrease in, uh, in oil demand, as Adam uh, mentioned, but I share the skepticism about uh, projecting this into the future and concluding <clears throat> that we have reached uh, or we will reach a, a, a peak in oil demand anytime soon. Uh, I believe that uh, some of the transformations brought about by the COVID uh, pandemic will, will stay with us. Um, like, you know, uh, the habit of having conferences like this one, uh, rather than traveling around the world for, for uh, uh, short meetings, or uh, a combination of uh, presential and remote uh, um, uh, instruction in, in uh, higher uh, education, I think that will uh, remain because in many ways it has proven uh, to be productive and, and um, has had uh, advantages. I think uh, people will tend to travel uh, less, uh, use uh, fewer planes. Uh, um, I think that is uh, to be welcomed. But, you know, Far, by far, you know, the vast majority of people in this world have never taken a plane and uh, they don't have access to internet. They don't probably don't have uh, a computer. And uh, all what we are talking about is something very much OECD centered. You know, the industrial countries of this world have this opportunity of changing, evolving the way of uh, doing business. But uh, the vast majority of people in this world may not have um, access to uh, uh, electricity or clean cooking fuels. So for them, uh, the, the equation is uh, completely different. And uh, for them, what matters is the price and the availability of uh, oil and, uh, and fuels that are derived from oil. And price is important because uh, uh, in a scenario in which we uh, have uh, abundant supply and uh, stagnating or slowly, uh, more slowly growing demand, prices are likely to remain uh, rather uh, low. Uh, and uh, that is uh, extremely important uh, in uh, uh, preventing a sudden or rapid 
uh, change uh, or decline uh, in demand because many people will find uh, increasingly convenient to uh, rely on, uh, on oil. So yes, we may read that uh, Boris Johnson is intending to ban uh, the sale of uh, um, internal combustion engines in, uh, by 2035. But from here to concluding that uh, demand for oil in the world uh, will uh, decline, there is a long way. So first of all, prices are important. Second, there are many uh, oil producers and uh, not all of them are major oil exporters. And I think that too is, uh, uh, is a significant uh, uh, point. Uh, certainly, uh, the United States, of the three main uh, oil producers in this world, uh, the United States, Russia, and Saudi Arabia, the United States is basically a, a, a perhaps uh, reaching self-sufficiency in oil, but basically a domestic uh, consumer of oil. And uh, Russia is, to a larger extent, a domestic uh, consumer of oil than Saudi Arabia. So it's uh, mostly the exporters that face the problem of uh, acceptance of oil and oil products in, in, in uh, foreign markets. The rest are going to, uh, uh, to focus on uh, perhaps domestic utilization, more domestic utilization through the transformation of oil in uh, uh, other non-fuel products, uh, um, either uh, substitution of other existing sources. There are various maneuvers that one can think of. And, you know, we see what happens in Germany, you know, they finally uh, achieved a consensus on uh, phasing out coal uh, only a, a year ago, more or less. And uh, the deadline for doing that is 2038. So, it is very difficult to kill a domestic uh, uh, <laughs> sector. I don't expect uh, uh, Joe Biden to be, uh, or anybody uh, after him, uh, to be able to pass in Congress a measure like uh, banning the sale of internal combustion engines or banning the use of oil, because uh, there is too much of a domestic constituency that would uh, uh, be hurt by that. And that is true in many countries because uh, oil is, uh, is produced in many countries, not just in the major oil exporters. Today, approximately 60% of uh, produced oil is traded internationally. What I can uh, easily visualize is the fact that uh, uh, less oil will be traded internationally. More of it will be used domestically, transformed domestically into other products, uh, either uh, uh, hydrocarbons not meant uh, for uh, fuel use, such as petrochemicals, or uh, uh, energy intensive products, which can be produced out of hydrocarbons with carbon capture and, uh, and sequestration, as Adam uh, was mentioning. It is clear that uh, oil producers in general have the best and cheapest opportunities to uh, sequester uh, CO2. And so it is logical to think in terms of uh, energy intensive industries moving towards uh, those locations in which oil is produced and CO2 can be more easily uh, stored. I think this is a, a broader consideration. Uh, at the moment, I don't uh, see that governments have come to terms with the necessity of moving towards a different kind of uh, uh, division of labor in which energy intensive uh, industries are located close to energy sources, be they uh, hydrocarbons or uh, renewable energy sources, because the same can be said of renewable energy sources. They are not equally available everywhere in the world. There are certain locations in which en renewable energy sources are more easily available, more conveniently available than in others. Uh, and this is, uh, by the way, something that uh, has been uh, 
uh, said by the, the Gulf uh, oil producers that are also potentially major producers of renewable uh, energy from sun and, and uh, to some extent wind. So uh, we need to accept that and uh, this new division of uh, labor and I don't see uh, much acceptance of it yet. And uh, we have uh, come out of a long period in which uh, uh, we had the, the ease of moving energy to where it was needed. You know, oil is very easily transported, so uh, gas less so, electricity less so, but we have been accustomed to, to the notion that uh, the availability of energy is not an important consideration in siting of industrial uh, This uh, inevitably will change. And, uh, um, oil uh, and, and uh, the location of industry will increasingly be uh, affected by the availability of energy. So less trade uh, in general and uh, uh, a different uh, division of labor. That's, that's the broader context in which we uh, need to, to um, uh, reason. Coming now to specifically uh, the Gulf oil producers, I think they have uh, uh, many uh, ideal uh, conditions to uh, be in the forefront of this process. Uh, they can uh, enhance uh, local uh, utilization uh, of uh, hydrocarbons, transformation of hydrocarbons into other products with carbon capture and sequestration, as Adam has already uh, said. And in that sense, uh, as Jim uh, uh, has uh, already uh, recalled, uh, we, I, I organized a small uh, uh, debate uh, with several uh, uh, people intervening, uh, asking the question, uh, should uh, Gulf major national oil companies in the Gulf uh, uh, aim at a carbon neutrality, announce a target of reaching carbon neutrality by 2050? And the answer was a unanimous yes, uh, uh, they should uh, announce such a target because they are uh, in best positions to uh, actually achieve this target. Uh, they are in a better position than anybody else in the world. So they should be uh, leading in this front. Now, uh, having said that, the combination of these different factors, relatively low prices of oil, the need to uh, invest very heavily in a transformation, in accelerating a transformation that in some cases has been going on for decades, but needs to be accelerated. Investing very heavily in the transformation of uh, uh, the, the uh, energy sector uh, and uh, the industrial sector to uh, put in place a an economy that is both uh, clean from the point of view of uh, energy and environment and uh, capable of exporting a wide array of uh, energy intensive products, uh, that requires a, a very significant economic effort. And as Jim was uh, mentioning, you know, the task of the national oil companies uh, of the oil producing countries is uh, both to enhance uh, the value of their uh, resources, but also to uh, support uh, their government financially, because these states are heavily reliant uh, or exclusively reliant on uh, the oil rent. And, and the oil rent uh, will be A, uh, reduced because of the lower prices and uh, probably also the higher costs implicit in uh, having to sequester the CO2, in having to uh, transform locally uh, into acceptable, internationally acceptable uh, products. And uh, also uh, there is a need to shift uh, much bigger resources towards investment from uh, current expenditure. Uh, so uh, there are major challenges ahead for uh, the governments of uh, the oil producing countries. Is this uh, going to be uh, a, a political challenge? Uh, I think so. I think uh, the so-called uh, rentier uh, social pact is uh, more 
solid uh, than many many people uh, believe, uh, but undoubtedly uh, there is need for uh, a transformation in uh, increased involvement of broader and broader sectors of society into uh, the process of uh, governing and putting in place this, uh, this transformation. That's all I have to say. Thank you, John. Thank you, Giacomo. Thank you very much. A uh, lot of things. I don't know where to start. Um, Jay, I wanted to ask you, are there specific questions that members are asking? Because I don't see them online, live, at least from my side. Uh, or shall I go ahead and start probing into everything that was said? I what think, is the, I think yeah. it would be good if maybe you, you probed for a few minutes and then we could go to questions. Um, to ask questions, and this is for everyone listening, it would be very helpful if you uh, could click uh, raise hand. And once you do so, um, John can call on you and then uh, you can unmute yourself, ask, and then we can proceed like that, if that makes any sense. Yes, uh, thank you, Jay. And uh, I apologize for the background noise by one of our members. Yes, they've Somebody been has summarily removed. Yes, very good. Um, I, I was I was not able to get everything. So I, I want to start by saying, um, <clears throat> what is what in your opinion, Adam, do you think is feasible over the next 10 years, given where we are in the energy market as to uh, what is feasible in terms of the balance between energy, um, carbon, uh, sequestration and then the demand on the oil producers uh, to be more energy conscious. Uh, is it feasible to move along the Paris um, Accord, the Paris Agreements, uh, versus what uh, what uh, everybody else wants to see the oil producing countries do and 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 deliver? Uh John, I think that's a really interesting question. I won't try to uh, predict what uh, oil companies are going to do, but I think the idea of uh, companies, uh, again, using uh, based on their own national circumstances and the resource base they have available uh, and their ability to, to do research and development and finance that will take different paths. Uh, but um, many companies, including Saudi Aramco, uh, are uh, looking very closely at, at ESG, you know, environment, social governance issues, and the idea of setting some kind of targets uh, for uh, moving towards uh, carbon neutrality or net zero uh, is important. Let me just, by the way, say that certainly for Saudi Arabia, it's very important to think about this as a net or balancing item. Uh, there are a lot of people that talk about zero carbon and you know, carbon is not the enemy. I mean, you, you're made of carbon and uh, you know, we, we, we breathe carbon dioxide, the bio cycle is very heavily involved in CO2. We just have, we have, uh, you know, uh, Jim McDonough, who's a very uh, well-known circular economy uh, advocate, uh, uh, has talked about three kinds of carbon. Uh, and there's uh, living carbon. Uh, there is uh, you know, uh, you carbon know, really that, that moves in, in the material cycles. And there is fugitive carbon. Fugitive carbon is the problem. And so what we want to do is deal with the fugitive carbon. So then I come back to co companies, I think, uh, ultimately uh, have to have the support of governments, uh, some sort of, uh, you know, even in the Paris Agreement, uh, Article 6 envisions uh, the concept of, of companies being able to uh, uh, make uh, arrangements for trading uh, in a transparent and and uh, and clear way uh, of of carbon, so that those people who have the ability to sequester it can get credit for that, and those who have the ability to pay for things uh, like green ammonia 
uh, or blue ammonia uh, can get credit for their targets. Uh, we don't want to double count, but there has to be some way to, to make this work. Um, I, I think that the uh, coming back to what can really be done, uh, there is a program underway in the kingdom now to create an, a circular carbon economy national framework. And the idea will be to look for ways to, um, to measure uh, the carbon from all and greenhouse gases from different sources uh, to be able to set um, performance indicators uh, to begin to make progress towards reducing fugitive emissions uh, and, and to do so in a way that makes sense given the circumstances in Saudi Arabia. That I think actually was the beauty of what the G20 ministers agreed to. I think what they said was, look, uh, we know that efficiency and renewables uh, are the most important. Most countries, most of the carbon management projects are efficiency and increasingly investment is going into renewables, even in the kingdom. Most of the uh, impact uh, in terms of carbon reduction now comes from efficiency. More of it over time will come from fuel switching. Uh, and, but what the G20 minister said is let's let's leave the field open. Let's let the market try to figure out what the best technology is. And I think that the companies need uh, to find ways to, uh, to begin to demonstrate the different technologies. And what we really need, just as an example, and then I'll stop, is direct air capture, depending on you know, whose numbers you believe, might cost more than 500, uh, uh, dollars a ton, you know, and it's got to get down to 50. If it gets down to 50, then, then you're in business. Then you, you kind of go, well, how are you ever going to do that? And the answer is you begin to experiment and you begin to uh, scale up. And, and uh, you know, if you went back 20 years and you said that uh, solar and wind were going to be uh, as competitive economically as they are now, most people wouldn't have believed you. Uh, but I, I'm back to this very simple theme of, of uh, we need to enable all of the options if we're really going to make progress on this. And I think the companies have to be able to show uh, that they are serious in making serious investments and strides towards accomplishing these goals. Thanks. Great. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Jim, I, I really uh, was fascinated uh, listening to some of the uh, challenges or maybe issues that you see uh, Aramco facing, uh, if, if I were to place it in that framework. And also in, in general, how the state uh, in Saudi Arabia will have to uh, rethink of its maybe larger role that ties into what Giacomo was saying about the rentier state and, and, and that. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, are we thinking of a new sort of Aramco that needs to unfold in the coming 10 years as we think about the future of energy, oil, Saudi Arabia? You, you talked about the uh, new possible uh, alliance with Israel. A lot has been said, more will be said in the future. Um, how do we put all these things in our thinking? It's, it's, uh, I really love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, well, I mean, it's sort of, you know, for lack of a better word, some uh, musings, I think. Per, so, so, some of this is musings, but it's based on uh, what Aramco's doing. I mean, they seem like they're moving uh, pretty quickly into the, in, you know, in, in, into these directions, uh, you know, trying to protect, uh, you know, the kingdom's system of governance by providing uh, uh, rents and trying to roll with the, uh, with changes in, um, uh, in, in global public opinion and, and changes in technology, uh, trying to promote ones that, uh, that, um, 
that it sees as uh, as strategic uh, and that that can prolong the uh, the lifespan of oil in the global economy, but also diversifying into ones that that uh, at least you know the sovereign wealth fund might be diversifying into things that don't use uh, oil, right? Buying shares in in, uh, in 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 companies that might be looked upon as kind of competitors for oil. So, I I think that. Um, the thinking at Aramco and in the ministry, uh, you know, and I'm sure it's backed by uh, by both of our the other sp main speaker. Actually, all all three of you, uh, uh, you know, have significant uh, uh, advisory roles uh, on this stuff. So, um, uh, you know, it's uh, they they seem to be um, You know, do, doing the right things, I think, in in, in, in from a from a uh, uh, you know the, from the kingdom's perspective, uh, to to kind of preserve its well-being. You know, to working towards diversification, but understanding that diversification is not going to bring in the types of rents that they're used to. I mean, Saudi Arabia. You know, if you look at their bond perspective, their their cost of production was is uh you know it's like seven dollars and fifty cents a barrel, including. Uh, you know, including uh, capital investment costs, right? So um, it's just that, you know, they're, they're not going to get the same level of profits that they're used to. So they need to not just diversify in other economic sectors, but diversify the way the government uh, uh, funds itself. Um, and they're doing that. They're, 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 um, uh, they're moving into taxation um, and they're, they're sort of um, enabling that by Opening up socially, right? So there's lots of uh, 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 social policy uh, uh, openings that are that are happening. Uh, closing down uh, a bit um, in terms of uh, free speech. Um, you know how much that is 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 an overstep, and how much of that is necessary. I'll you know I'll leave to others. Um, but um, uh, you know there's there's lots of pieces to this. Um, you know if if they see the U.S. especially moving away from oil uh, and becoming less dependent on their supply, but maybe less, you know, if, if oil starts to lose its monopoly on transportation, then they've got a strategic problem. They've got a kind of a, um, a, a hard security issue if, if, if the United States becomes less interested. No evidence of that happening, really. Uh, you know, the U.S. still has 60,000 troops stationed in and around the Gulf. Uh, but there's sure a lot of talk about it, right? So, you know, uh, 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 foreign affairs, the, you know, the big foreign policy journal uh, has had some pretty serious articles by serious thinkers saying that, look, we can go back, the U.S. can go back to, uh, you know, this sort of over the horizon uh, uh, defense posture in the Gulf. We don't need to be spending $100 billion plus a year protecting, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia and the other uh, oil kingdoms there. Uh, and if that happens, you know, the Saudis will need, you know, if, if their strategic importance to the United States or to, to the world declines, they're going to need to make alternate arrangements. Uh, I think we're seeing that happen with them and with the UAE. Uh, you know, they're both getting more interventionist around the region, developing alternate uh, alliances. Um, you know, this partnership with Israel is, is, is an interesting one. I, I'm, I'm sure it's got some uh, you know, some uh, uh, hard security uh, protection aspects to it. Um, I would argue the UAE's nuclear power uh, um, uh, foray into nuclear power is part is partly driven by strategic security concerns, right? I mean, I think that the U.S. and other powers would be are would consider a, um, a downfall of the regime in Abu Dhabi to be a, a, a big problem if there's um, if there's a danger of prolif prolifer proliferation beyond just a you know, potential loss of oil supply to the global economy. So, so I think these these countries are they're already moving. Uh, 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 I think fairly quickly for for the you know the size of these operations uh, to try and shore up their their longevity and the longevity of their regimes. Thank you, thank you, Jim. Uh, no, it's it's very interesting. I. I, I I, I do tend to see that the the Israeli uh, element uh, has some of these uh, basic uh, uh, dynamics of some kind of an alliance. And however, I'm still not sure if the Israelis understand what they're getting into uh, as the Americans are exiting, not yet physically as I completely agree with you, 
but mentally and, and probably uh, psychologically, they're they're exiting from the region, um, and then the Israelis are uh, are thinking, or they should be thinking, what are we getting into? Because then probably Saudi and the UAE will think of replacing them as the the missing gap, um, or or not. It remains to be seen. But uh, that that moves to Giacomo. Giacomo, you have been pondering away while Jim has been thinking. And I, I wanted to, you know, ask you, are we now in an era of not just the new social contract, but a very new fiscal contract that uh, all of these countries in the Gulf and unavoidably we're talking about the Gulf and predominantly Saudi Arabia as most of us have done uh, a lot of our careers in Saudi Arabia working and thinking about Saudi Arabia, maybe less in your case, but uh, for sure in my case, and now in Adam's case, and of course, Jim, but it's unavoidable not to think about Saudi Arabia. Uh, but are we now in a new era? Uh, the social contract is slowly waning, and now we have a new fiscal reality. Um, what What is the region going to be facing, uh, notwithstanding what you said, which I also agree by all means that, you know, oil is not going to disappear and the doomsday scenario that oil demand just disappears and uh, suddenly EV is going to replace it. My big question is when they talk about electric vehicles, especially in the UK, uh, they're not uh, doing yet the thinking behind the infrastructure. Uh, it requires an enormous amount of infrastructure just to have the plugins and just to have the the necessary uh, requirements and how are we going to generate this electricity that everybody is thinking about we're just not going to do it overnight uh, Giacomo what are your thoughts on electric vehicles well not only and also about the the contract the you you said the rentier estate will very much uh, stay, but uh, the elements of the social contract, the fiscal contract. Yes, uh, uh, well, the two two topics are quite different. Uh, on um, on uh, uh, the rentier state and and uh, the fiscal uh, uh, future of uh, the, the Gulf countries, uh, you need to uh, distinguish uh, between the situation of. Uh, at least three countries, Kuwait, Qatar, and uh, I would say Abu Dhabi, potentially the UAE, but it's Abu Dhabi. Uh, these are uh, uh, countries, uh, in the case of uh, Abu Dhabi and Emirate, uh, that um, have sufficiently small populations and sufficiently large oil resources uh, that they can think in terms of uh, accumulating uh, large sovereign wealth funds, uh, which uh, will uh, um, possibly uh, generate uh, enough uh, revenue to uh, support uh, their respective states, especially if uh, they progressively get rid of the uh, huge uh, expatriate population that, uh, that they have, you know, so, so they can they can shrink and survive on the basis of uh, uh, their uh, financial heritage, okay? Uh, Saudi Arabia does not belong to this category uh, because it's a, a country of a certain size, a population of a certain size, and the simple accumulation of financial assets um, uh, will not suffice. Uh, so uh, in the dilemma, in the alternative between industrial and uh, financial diversification. The financial diversification uh, is uh, not sufficient uh, for uh, solving uh, uh, or guaranteeing the future of, uh, of Saudi Arabia. Now, we have been seeing a good deal of financial uh, diversification so far. Uh, the decision to uh, privatize uh, uh, Saudi Aramco, even only 5% of it, is a decision that um, has the meaning of uh, uh, acquiring a, a, a market uh, capitalization, a, a measure of market capitalization for this company, 
in uh, therefore uh, allowing it to um, uh, become uh, an asset uh, uh, in, uh, in the portfolio of a sovereign wealth fund, uh, PIF, and uh, Saudi Aramco has been, um, um, has been uh, now located in the portfolio of PIF. Um, we we uh, see contradictory decisions, uh, frankly, coming from Saudi Arabia in these times, uh, uh, because uh, on the one hand, yes, uh, uh, there is all the emphasis of on uh, maintaining uh, uh, the future of uh, oil and uh, continuing uh, in the in the line of industrial diversification that has been uh, pursued ever since. Uh, uh, the uh, process of development planning started, and that's very much what uh, you know. Also, Adam was saying before. So uh, there is this uh, line of thinking. Uh, at the same time, uh, we see uh, uh, certain decisions, such as a recent decision to maintain the level of um, dividend uh, from Saudi Aramco in making it possible by borrowing on the market. Uh, that's a kind of behavior that you may expect from uh, uh, companies that are widely traded and need to uh, take care of the fidelity of their uh, shareholders, uh, but uh, configures uh, a threat that has always been there and much uh, um, ventilated uh, about national oil companies, that is that they may become cash cows and uh, not be allowed to maintain a, a sufficient share of, uh, of their surplus for uh, their own investment, okay? And that, so when I read that Saudi Aramco is cutting back on investment and uh, borrowing in order to maintain the level of uh, uh, dividend payments, I am worried, okay? Uh, the problem with uh, the fiscal uh, future is that you need uh, to have a, a credible uh, fiscal base, that is a base that uh, you may tax. And, and uh, at the moment, uh, what we have seen is a tripling of uh, VAT in Saudi Arabia. Uh, which is uh, a, ne a needed and, and uh, positive uh, measure, uh, but VAT is a consumption tax. And obviously uh, consumption is uh, uh, a, an available uh, base for taxation uh, in the kingdom, uh, but you cannot uh, uh, indefinitely increase uh, consumption taxes First of all, because they become inflationary, and second, because they are uh, highly regressive from the point of view of uh, income distribution. So you need to accompany uh, consumption taxes with taxes on uh, uh, income and wealth uh, and taxes on corporations. Uh, but today, uh, the, there is not an independent private sector uh, that uh, is, um, uh, capable of uh, becoming a, a significant source of income uh, for, uh, for the state. Um, the, there has been uh, uh, words uh, uh, about uh, empowering the private sector and, and uh, relying more on the private sector, but the deeds have been uh, rather in, um, in the opposite uh, direction including the decision to, to uh, ask Saudi Aramco uh, to uh, buy uh, Sabic. Uh, uh, Sabic is a company that has uh, been a candidate uh, for uh, privatization, full privatization for the past uh, 40 years, okay? And in the end, it was not privatized. It was uh, um, Renationalize under the aegis of, uh, of Saudi Aramco. Uh, so there are many positive uh, developments uh, in the kingdom, but there are also uh, contradictory, uh, contradictory uh, signals that um, make me worry about uh, about the future. In addition, you know, 
I do believe that um, it is not possible to evolve uh, towards greater reliance on, uh, on uh, taxation uh, without uh, at the same time uh, accepting greater participation on the part of uh, uh, broader uh, strata uh, of the population. And there had been a, a, a movement in that uh, direction uh, in the past uh, with the creation of the Majlis Ashura with uh, several um, steps in the direction of broader participation into the political uh, uh, debate. Uh, you know, I uh, years ago um, put together a, a book on constitutional reform uh, and political participation in the Gulf, which exactly, you know, uh, speculated that uh, this might be a way to progressively evolve uh, towards uh, greater uh, participation in, uh, and perhaps in some distant future democracy. Uh, but uh, uh, over the past uh, 10 years, the movement has been in the opposite uh, direction completely. And I think this is uh, this is a major problem, together with the uh, inability to come to terms uh, with the uh, regional situation. And so, uh, you know, we cannot forget uh, Yemen, uh, we cannot forget uh, uh, the, the uh, difficult relations, uh, to say the least, uh, with Iran. And Iran is a reality, you know, uh, and uh, in the end, uh, if you want to prosper economically, you have to accept the realities uh, in your region and uh, come to terms with them. It may be extremely difficult, but you have to uh, come to terms and seek compromises uh, because uh, the alternative is necessarily a dead end. Great, thank you. Thank you, Giacomo. I think we have uh, the first question. Uh, Jay, I think you have a question, please. I do. So thanks everyone for, uh, I've learned a terribly large amount in the last, in the last hour or so. So thank you very much for uh, all of your different perspectives. So I'll go in with the first question and then we'll open up to the audience. Um, I'm just going to throw the grenade in there. When do we think peak oil is going to be? Uh, and if we had to pick a year, each of us, um, just because every day on Bloomberg, you see something else, you say it's now, it's next year, it's happening today. Um, it would be really interesting to hear when you guys actually think uh, peak oil is going to happen. If you want to start, John, maybe? Let me, uh, let me try a, a really quick answer to that. If you go on our uh, website, uh, capsarc.org, you can find something called the Como, Capsarc Oil uh, market outlook. Uh, Mark Finley actually helps out on that. And maybe Mark would have a comment on this. We believe that oil demand in 2022 will actually be higher than it was in 2019. Uh, so we'll see a recovery in oil demand on a global basis. Uh, if I had, to, you know, looking at forecasts from um, organizations like the Energy Information Administration, which I used to head in Washington, I think it's a pretty reliable uh, not too partisan, not partisan, uh, you know, independent, pretty objective organization. Uh, they'd say sometime, uh, you know, around 2040, maybe it uh, plateaus. Uh, but the idea that it's going to, going to, has already peaked and is going to fall, I don't believe. And a final comment uh, if I'm wrong and it has peaked and it is going down in 2040, we're still going to have 60 million barrels a day of oil demand, then somebody's going to have to produce that. And Saudi Arabia will be one of the countries producing it. Yeah. I think uh, if I may step in, uh, I, I think uh, the answer depends on whether you believe uh, that. Uh, uh, income per capita differences in the world uh, will continue to narrow down as I've done uh, over the past decades. And the difference between uh, the United States uh, and top uh, uh, rich countries and the poorer countries are, have been narrowing. If that continues, uh, I don't think we are going to see uh, peak oil anytime soon because uh, the emerging countries are interested in economic development, in economic growth. In, uh, they will be using oil. Uh, it's uh, extremely difficult uh, to envisage that uh, 
uh, they might do that uh, without uh, making use of hydrocarbons. If on the contrary, you believe that um, the 600 million people uh, who have no access to electricity in Africa will stay without access uh, and will uh, stay without uh, uh, clean cooking uh, facilities and so on and so forth, then yes, I mean, we are rich. We can afford to, to uh, move away from oil and, uh, uh, and we will, uh, but uh, it's a problem for the rest of the world. Jim. Well, gosh, um, I uh, always try to avoid these kind of questions, but, um, <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, I have taken sort of a, a quick look at some of these different forecasts for um, when, when oil is going to peak. And they range from, you know, a year ago to 2050, right? So really broad range. But there's an interesting thing about them, right? So the uh, um, the bullishness of the forecast um, seems to be linked to the uh, you know the main economic activity in the in the place that produces it, right? Whether it's a company or a region or a country or uh, or the thrust of the organization that produces it, right? So um, so how reliable these things are. I don't, I mean, it's, some of them, you know, the ones that are produced by companies seem to be the, you know, they seem to be making these predictions to perhaps maybe even, you know, not, you know, not, uh, not on purpose. Right. But the, the, to, 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 to try and um, uh, validate a business plan that's already been put in place. Right. So if you're bullish on crude, you know, Exxon's um, uh, uh, prediction is going to look different than, if you're trying to validate, you know, BP's trying to validate its uh, its investments uh, away from oil, right? So, um, so there's 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 a broad range. Um, I don't know who's right. I mean, you know, there's you know six what is it six billion people in the developing world now, and 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 you know roughly roughly uh, you know one and a half in the developed world. Um, so that's a pretty big number. Um, uh, you know, so it would seem that, uh, you know, if they start, you know, you know, as, 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 you know, as, as, as economies grow, they'll start using, uh, you know, they'll start wanting to train, get, you know, to, to move around the earth and they'll also start consuming more plastic. So, um, uh, so I suppose I would, I would weigh, you know, weigh in on a, on a later that, you know, that oil has not peaked yet and it, maybe it'll peak at the end of the decade or, um, you know, sometime beyond that. I mean, you, you, the other part about this is so difficult is government policy, you know, in 190 countries is so hard to predict and it, 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 it kind of swings back and forth. I mean, we're seeing global public opinion harden every year. The Pew uh, survey uh, numbers get bigger and bigger um, for the, 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 the places that uh, the, the countries where, where concern is growing about climate change and, and, and about the need for action. That hasn't yet corresponded with oil demand. Um, but you know, we may have seen peak coal. Coal may have peaked, right? I mean, it's it's or may it's you know it looks like it's plateaued. So um, you know, it's 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 possible that it'll that it'll come. Uh, but I don't know. I can't say when. Well, I let me say also. Let me add to the confusion here, uh, uh, Jay. That um, I think this is all motivated by the fact that we're looking at numbers in uh, the OECD world, predominantly in the US, and some of the very fancy Nordic countries that have uh, decided to go EV. And the often quoted country, uh, Sweden, is used as an example that electric vehicles are being bought in massive numbers, and they are having these fantastic deals um, and the Swedes are leading the way. But uh, I'm yet to be surprised that uh, in Nigeria, they're still buying normal cars. And Nigeria 10 years from now will be a country of 400 million people or thereabout. And India is just getting around buying cars. And uh, China still is buying predominantly cars that have an internal combustion engine. 
this is not to say that Toyota has not decided to, to produce EVs from 2030 onwards and the UK will have only EVs dominating the scene. Uh, but uh, there are more cars to be sold in emerging markets over the next 10 years than electric vehicles put together in the US and Europe. And I think this is the disconnect. Uh, we are being dominated by a one-sided view, which is the OECD view. Um, so I, I don't think that uh, oil demand is going to disappear, but it's being emotionally guided by COVID and the blurriness created by uh, the uh, disinterest to buy uh, cars in the first few months of 2020, given that uh, the world uh, is motivated by what's happening in the OECD world. Africa is not facing uh, the same kind of pandemic that Europe and the US is facing. Uh, Southeast Asia and the Far East is not facing the kind of pandemic that we are facing. And there are very different uh, ways to, to look at this. So I think we are observing this from an OECD dominated view, going back to Giacomo's point. And I think there is more legroom for the oil market than what meets the eye today. Um, I, I think that's that's where I will I will put myself in this. I mean, there are more oil traders today, uh, and uh, compared to ten years ago, the the oil market is still dominating. And you look at options and futures; uh, that's a huge business for any trading desk. If you are in uh, an investment bank, and if you are in Goldman Sachs. John, either way, it's still important to advance and accelerate the technology associated with mitigation. Um, and uh, so I see that as really being uh, really being critical. I mean, you know, it's like we, we uh, you know, even if it's peaked, it's still going to be sizable production. And if we're going to make progress on what everybody seems to believe is a, a truly worthwhile goal, uh, then we need to move that technology forward. And it's not going to be easy. One of the recommendations from the T20, the Think 20 engagement group, was that, uh, that the stimulus funds for, uh, to help economic recovery in the face of COVID, uh, a lot of people are saying, let's make it a green recovery, uh, you know, kind of do better. Uh, but let's not exclude... Uh, things like carbon capture from that green uh, stimulus. Great. Should we take a couple more questions? Thank you, guys. It was really helpful. Um, good to hear something different than when you hear in Bloomberg. Should we go to Peter, maybe, John? Yeah, Peter. Hi. Uh, I'm a postdoc research with uh, Rice University. I'm actually doing some research with Jim right now, uh, looking at when OPEC is able to collude. So I just have a game theory model, a repeated prisoner's dilemma game effectively. And I'm modeling it out at different scenarios. So like how much global demand is there and what's the base price that we're looking at. And my research is sort of consistently finding that as price decreases and as global demand decreases, both of those trends result in it being easier for OPEC to collude. So the theoretical limits on rent from collusion increase as both of those factors go down. So a big takeaway from this is as we do this energy transition, as prices drop and demand drops, OPEC is gonna be an increasingly powerful player in the global oil markets. And I wanted to know if people, does that seem in line with other people's research? Uh, let me just mention that CAPSARC has done research on the issue of does the spare capacity and the use of spare capacity by OPEC add economic value on a global basis and the findings in the peer-reviewed energy journal uh, are that it does, that the ability of OPEC to, um, to 
help stabilize and reduce the volatility in oil prices actually has a positive net economic value to the global economy of something like $200 million a year. The well, first study we did on that was in 2018. We had data through 2014. We updated that just this year uh, with data uh, through 2019 with the same findings, basically. I had to laugh. Uh, I always, I think that you probably get more people to read your study if you use the word other than collusion. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I'll go back to our study. Our study shows that the use of spare capacity and OPEC's ability to add to or remove oil from the market has actually had a positive net economic benefit. That's a, that's a different, there's a different connotation in that uh, than, than collusion, which implies market manipulation, in my view. Um, so I don't, uh, I, 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 that's kind of a view that's, I mean, I'm obviously uh, is, uh, is informed by a, a lot of years being involved in this business and, and the work that CAPSARC did in these studies that are available on our website if you want to go see. Um, Peter, I don't know, Peter, have John, you back that? to you if somebody else wants to jump in. I wanted to see if P Peter, I think you've, have, we took a look. I know I've, I've read that. That's Axel's paper. I think you're talking about, he was the lead, lead author on that. Um, Axel Pierou. Yeah. Um, we, that's, uh, I kind of referenced your, your, your modeling and my, my remarks. So maybe before you got on, but, but you've taken a look at that paper, haven't you? I'm yeah, sure, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it, uh, it, we, I, I, you might have missed some of the beginning of the discussion, but um, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 were you here for the previous question about when the when the market might peak and some of the caveats about that? Yeah, and so what to allude to Adam's points, like having a lower volatility on your oil prices is going to make it easier for consumers to buy it. And so as OPEC continues to collude more moving forward, we're going to see prices that are low, supply that's easy to access, and then prices that are stable. So it's going to become a more attractive fuel moving forward, especially for people in the developing world. The, the stability of the prices is sort of what allowed oil to come in and be this forefront of uh, transportation fuel at the beginning, like when it was competing with whale fuel oil and stuff like that. Stabilizing the markets and reducing volatility is not, uh, not easy. And one of the concerns that I have is that the, uh, what you're seeing in the oil companies in terms of reduction in capital spending uh, difficulty in borrowing, uh, difficulty in floating uh, uh, equity uh, could result in a, a shortfall in production that may show up in 2022, 23, sometime uh, that makes the markets hard to hard to manage. Uh, my experience again in doing, being an oil analyst literally since the 1970s uh, is that there are cycles and the cycles uh, are hard to control and that you have periods of overshooting and undershooting of, of a, a market-based um, equilibrium point. And, uh, and that we have to be careful of that. So one of the, uh, just last, last comment, and you know, usually I talk about these cycles in the, in the sense of, you know, you often go to meetings and you'll hear somebody being introduced, so oh, so-and-so has 25 years experience in the markets or, or what have you. And, and I like to say, I've got about seven years experience, but, but six times. <laughs> Uh, wow. That's pretty good. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> well, do we have any more, uh, more questions? Because I'll have to ask another one. 
Okay, let's uh, just just kind of given the given the current situation with with OPEC, um, like what do we think is going to happen uh, now? Uh, just given given the postponement of the meeting results and the UAE being more vocal. Um, I mean, I guess there are two questions there. The first is what what's going to happen, and the second is what does this really really tell us about the the future and the sustainability of of of, of the block? Um, you know, if the UAE is is not being a compliant younger brother to uh, to the kingdom, uh, what is what does that portend in your view? I mean, the UAE's been investing heavily in in new production capacity. It's it's at you know, if, if, you know, just saw something on Twitter. I don't know. You know, I'm not sure how reliable this is, but <laughs> but they're um, they've been working to to get above four million barrels a day for a while, and they may be uh, uh, you know nearing five million barrels a day of production uh, soon after this long period of of, of investment. Uh, but their quota is is just above two, right? So it, it's two and change. So you know, they've got a they're already shouldering a, uh, a a pretty large burden. Um, I think, you know, they and, and 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 some other countries are willing to do that for a while. But if they start to see, you know, the free riders, uh, you know, especially shale, um, uh, you know, not comply. You know, they they've taken off, off as much as shale has, right? I mean, shale's down by what about well, maybe a little bit more, right? So shale's down by about maybe you know, roughly two, maybe a little less than two million barrels uh, a day since its peak um, uh, or at the beginning of this year. Um, but uh, if, if they start to see a revival, there's going to be a lot of itchy trigger fingers among uh, a big uh, producers that have low cost capacity that they can bring, out, bring on, on stream pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, some countries don't have that long time horizon that, that's, that, that the Saudis have where they you know they uh, they they want more Saudis. You know are always you know seeking stability in markets and uh, you know stepping back from 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 rash decisions. Uh, normally, anyway, I don't know that wasn't the case this spring, but um, uh, I don't know. So so I think there's a, a a bit of a difference. So many you know such a diverse group uh, with 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 so many differences of, of opinion. And I think it's it, it's not as clear of an argument this time around whether. You know whether cutting is the you know continuing the cuts at the same level is 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 the optimal policy or a bit more a bit more production. Uh, you know it was really clear in in April that that's what needed to happen, uh, but now less so. So you know and I think it's natural that you're going to see disagreement on, in in this kind of environment. In general, if I may step in uh, here. Um... Uh, maintaining uh, discipline within OPEC uh, is not easy in, um, for a long period of time. Uh, OPEC reacts uh, very effectively when faced with a crisis, you know, the, the collapse of uh, prices. Uh, that is something that focuses everybody's mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, as soon as uh, the situation improves, uh, doubts emerge, and uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, uh, it is much more likely uh, that uh, production will increase out of a number of countries than uh, the reverse. Uh, Libya, uh, thanks God, is improving and, and uh, is uh, producing significantly more uh, than it uh, did only a few months ago. Um, the situation in Iran, after the election of uh, Joe Biden, uh, has a chance, an opportunity to improve. It's certainly not a given, but uh, you know that's the possible direction of change. And uh, the same uh, is known about Russia. Russia. Uh, some of the major companies in Russia have never really uh, accepted uh, this kind of situation and Russia has not uh, uh, been implementing the cuts in full. So you can see that there is uh, an inevitable drift in a direction and that is what we have seen time and again and sooner or later uh, uh, Saudi Arabia will say enough is enough and they will uh, uh, start a new uh, a new uh, price war, 
and then the price will collapse uh, everybody's mind will focus again and you, you know that's the nature of the game it's it's uh, it's not a game to be easily implemented on a on a, a consistent basis it goes through a repetition of crisis it's a Thank blunt you. instrument that price war you know it's uh it, it hurts everybody it is, uh, it is, but uh, you know, we have seen many uh, instances of it being used, and I think we'll see more uh, because it's extremely difficult to maintain uh, uh, discipline within uh, within OPEC. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to maintain discipline among two dozen countries anywhere, right? <laughs> Especially when they're all sacrificing. I mean, they're all yeah. making. So, you know, taking these actions that are contrary to their national interests, you know, for the alleged greater good. Uh, and if they see that greater good being whittled away, then it's tough. I mean, it's, a, it's always a tough call to do that, I think. It's, I think it's impressive that they can do it at all. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you can uh, read the situation as being uh, a glass half full uh, rather than uh, half empty, but it's, it's not... Uh completely empty. There is not uh, an authority that is capable of uh, really uh, maintaining discipline within such a group, uh, in, unless uh, you reach the point when the Saudis decide to punish everybody. Right. I think maybe if we can squeeze in just one last question from Marcus, if you all have, uh, have the time, we can, we can wrap up. Great, thanks, Jay. And just to echo what Jay said earlier, thank you everyone for what's been a, a talk full of a massive amount of interesting information. Um, I'm an undergraduate at Cambridge. I do Middle Eastern studies and uh, specific interest in Iran. So my uh, questions regarding that, and it's about the potential impacts of a Biden deal with Iran, uh, what that mean for OPEC and also oil generally, and also can we expect to see that being a significant source of pressure from the Gulf countries on Biden not to do a, a generous deal with Iran, uh, allowing them to start um, releasing oil again uh, or not? So really just about the pot potential impact of that. And that's for anybody on the panel. Thank you. I, mean, I can I can give you a few quick thoughts if uh, if if uh, if I may. Um, I, you know, it doesn't so, it doesn't seem well until a couple of days ago. It probably wasn't on the top uh, of of Biden's agenda, right? Um, uh, you know, there's there he's got a few other uh, uh, items that are probably going to take uh, that are going to consume him uh, when he comes in. Um, uh, but I would suspect that enforcing the sanctions on Iran, uh, that, that the Biden administration, even, even in the absence of a deal, there might be a little less um, uh, emphasis on enforcing those sanctions. So you might see more oil leaking out, uh, you know, unofficially uh, from Iran. So there might be a bit more uh, uh, coming to market. Um, making the deal is gonna be, gonna be tough. It's been made a lot tougher by this uh, alleged, you know, this assassination apparently by Israel of uh, this uh, nuclear scientist. I think that's getting, you know, there's gonna be some repercussions from that, uh, unfortunately, that, um, uh, that already seem to be happening. Uh, and, you know, at some point, if this kind of behavior keeps up, I mean, I think Iran, you know, the, the, even the, the, all, probably across the board politically in Iran, they're gonna see, see that they're, they're gonna keep having this sort of um, suffering these kinds of attacks until they get a, a nuclear deterrent. So I think this, this kind of behavior is like pushing them even further towards, uh, uh, you know, going, going nuclear, uh, developing a nuclear weapon. So uh, I think it's unfortunate, but maybe Biden can, can interrupt that process. Um, but uh, I know there's, there's, there's a, many other things on his agenda that may take pre precedence unless, you know, we start to see more uh, more of these things, uh, you know, these, these unfortunate events, uh, uh, attacks, etc. I see um, little opportunity for um, a deal and an improvement in the situation. Um, 
partly because uh, the nature of the situation is such that you need an improvement, uh, uh, not just uh, following an election in the United States, but in the region. Uh, you need uh, all participants uh, to the game in the region to be convinced uh, that uh, it is necessary to compromise. And at the moment, uh, this uh, willingness to compromise is not there, uh, starting from uh, within the, the, the GCC. Uh, I think that uh, for as long as the uh, conflict uh, between uh, uh, the UAE, Saudi Arabia uh, on one hand and Qatar on the other hand is not uh, solved, uh, there is little prospect of um, moving towards uh, a broader Gulf um, uh, agreement uh, in, and uh, an agreement um, with Iran. Uh, and the same uh, is true for the situation in Yemen uh, and so on. I mean, uh, we, we have uh, so many obstacles uh, on this road. I think your question was, how will the Biden administration, uh, you know, what kind of energy policy will they follow? Uh, Biden is a pretty uh, moderate, I think, in, in many ways, and is certainly his campaign platform uh, indicated that moderation uh, relative to um, other uh, candidates uh, like Bernie Sanders, for example. And I, I think I'd just point out that uh, the United States and Saudi Arabia and have had a, a pretty strong uh, relationship for uh, the period that goes all the way back to the 1940s. And uh, like any relationship that spans that length of a period of time, there are ups and downs. Uh, but I think that the U.S. Uh, still has lots of reasons to want to remain engaged in this region. Uh, and just as one example, uh, there was a lot of talk five years ago, 10 years ago, that we were going to be energy independent. And that would mean that we didn't have to have any worries at all about what was happening in the Middle East. And that's obviously proven to be uh, a, a very poor forecast. Uh, the United States has many reasons that go beyond just oil or imported oil to, to remain engaged in the MENA region in general. This is the MENA forum uh, for Cambridge. And I suspect that, uh, that that engagement will continue through a Biden presidency, just as it did through Trump and Obama and, and uh, Bush before him and through many other presidents across a very long period of time. Thank you. Thank you for interesting answers. Thank you for your question, Marcus. Great. Well, I think everyone, I think we've uh, exceeded our, our time. Thank you to our speakers who, uh, who stuck with us uh, after the event technically ended. And thank you, of course, to everyone who was listening in. Um, this has been extremely educational for me, and I'm sure everyone else can say the same. Um, so thanks again. And uh, yeah, thank you to John for moderating and thank you to everyone who asked questions. Uh, and see you at our future events. You can find them all at cmanaf.org um, and of course on social media as well, so on and so forth. And that's all. So thank you very much, everyone. And enjoy the rest of thank your you. week. All right, bye. Good seeing thank everybody. You. Thank you, Adam and Jack. Bye, bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks, John. Hey, Jim.